Good morning and welcome. We're back again uh, after being here last week with our seniors and their parents and grandparents. Uh, we find ourselves um, sharing together this way again uh, this Sunday. And we'll be this way next week as well. Uh, our anticipated regathering is August the 2nd. However, no one really knows what's going to happen between now and then um, either. So uh, we're taking it a week at a time, basically, but I'm glad you've chosen to spend some time this morning um, as we share worship together. If you're watching us and you're not uh, engaged or a part of a local congregation, or if you're at some distance from where we are here in Farmville in North Carolina, we uh, welcome you and are glad that you've chosen to uh, share this time with us as well. Let me also add quickly before Justin shares a prelude, um, if you would like to uh, uh, find out more about who we are, you can visit our website. It's fbcfarmvillenc.org. There's also a link there where you can uh, give a donation if you feel so led. Uh, you can also mail it to the church by the address that's there on the, on the um, uh, website. So uh, thank you for that and for your consideration and for being here this morning. So at this time, I'll hush and Justin will uh, bring us into worship with the prelude. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Justin. Hear these words as a call to worship. A word of encouragement came from prophet to people. Live a life that is full. Build, plant, eat, love, multiply. Pray for your communities. Keep God in the center of all that is. Let us worship today with hope in our hearts for some, something happens within us that reminds us that we can live as God desires, having made a promise of faithfulness to us, and we can put our trust in that promise. Let us pray. Lord, help us to relax. Take from each of us the tension that makes peace impossible. Take from each of us the fears that do not allow us to venture out. Take from each of us the worries that have blur, blurred and blinded our sight. Take from each of us the distress that hides your joy and help us to know that we are with you, that we are in your care, and that we are in your love, and most importantly, that we are one with you. Amen. Good morning. Over the 4th of July, I went to Brevard, North Carolina, and stayed on Eagle Lake with my cousin. Very social distancing. We didn't do a whole lot, but we did get out and go to a place called Living Waters. This place had a beautiful waterfall. And when we got there, we had a little bit of trouble finding it, but we, we were finally able to get down to the waterfall. But as we were making our way down, another person stopped us and said, make sure you take the trail all the way to the end. She said, it'll be worth it. Just go all the way to the end of the trail. Well, at first, when we first got down there, the waterfall was right there. There really wasn't a whole lot of a trail. We're like, well, what was she talking about? So it set us out on kind of like a mini adventure. And, um, and here we are in flip-flops, um, cause it's a great idea to go hiking in flip-flops, but, um, we finally find this trail. And so we start walking down the trail. And as we go to the trail, there's little spots where you can get off the trail and go back down to the water and see the rocks and the water. But the woman had said, make sure you go all the way to the end. And so we were bound and determined to go all the way to the end. And we did. We, we did not give up, even though we thought we would never get there. Um, we finally made it to the end. Of this trail and it was absolutely gorgeous so so much worth the hiking and flip-flops to get there um, and that's kind of where God leads us and I think God's leading us now um, we're on this path and a lot of us don't know what we're doing you know school's questionable whether, whether we're gonna go back in the fall or not go back in the fall um, even being able to have church together as a church body in a, in a building um, all these different questions and things are getting thrown at us. Um, and God's got us in a place where he's telling us, hold on, don't give up. We're in the in-between right now. Um, I think God is leading us somewhere really good. And, you know, God's got that Jeremiah 29 that says, I know the plans that I have for you. We have to trust that he knows what he's doing. He knows so much more than what we know and what he's guiding us through right now is only going to make us stronger and as long as we cling to him and trust that God's got us in his hands and he's got so much more and so much better than now planned for us then we're going to make it through we just can't give up and we have to go to the end because it's going to be so worth it if we hold on to him and keep him in our hearts through every step of our journey nothing's going to be what he has planned for us. So remember, don't give up. We're in the in-between and we're going to make it. So it's going to be worth it and it's going to be beautiful. So let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for this time in the in-between with you. Help us to stay strong. Help us not to wither. Help us to just keep our sights on you for what you have for us in the end is so much worth it now. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Holly and Justin and, um, and Sarah. Our scripture today comes first from Jeremiah chapter 29. I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> Subtitled, Jeremiah's Letter to the Exiles in Babylon. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests and prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconahai and the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Eleazar, son of Shaphan, and Gomorrah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah had sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem 
to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they prophesy to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, Only when Babylon's seventy years are complete will I visit you, and I will fulfill you to my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future and a hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile." The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And then from uh, Luke's gospel, um, chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. Then he, Jesus, went down with them and came to Nazareth and, and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and years and in divine and human favor. The gospel of Christ. Praise His holy name. Wednesday night, I shared with you some thoughts about, uh, as kind of a preview to today, about the in-between time. The in-between time. And how difficult in-between is for us. We're not constructed to handle those times very well, are we? We, we get anxious. Um, uh, it's kind of like, I think, as I, the illustration I used the other night was, it's, it's kind of like um, waiting to get the results of a test that we've had done. Um, it's like uh, a teenager waiting for that period of time between their learner's permit and their license. It's like a church waiting to call a new minister. Um, or, in a more contemporary sense, waiting to be able to regather here for worship. And if you're like me, maybe you've wondered about that in-between time from the passage, the two verses I just read in Luke, until we read about Jesus again in chapter 3 when he shows up at the River Jordan to be baptized. The in-between times. We really aren't good at dealing with them. We're impatient. We're uneasy. We try to force outcomes that many times can cause us more heartache than just relaxing in the in-between time. The passage from Jeremiah that I just read um, uh, is familiar, but probably just because of verse 11 and 12. We, We cite that, we read it a lot, especially in times of distress and uncertainty. But we need to get a handle on the whole context of what what Jeremiah is saying there when he's quoting the Lord in, uh, uh, to the exiles in Babylon. Because it talks about their in-between time while they're in exile. Judah had been defeated by Babylon and all the Jews had been taken in, in detention. In captivity, if you will. Um, and that basically is the context for uh, his letter. His prophecy. He writes to these folks who are defeated, they're weary, they're captive, they want to go home, they don't like it where they are, but they can't. And he gives them God's message on living with the things they cannot change. And that, my dear friends, is where the struggle is for us, is it not? All the time. In a lot of different ways. Just like it was for these folks. You see, He's telling them in summary, when, you live, when you're living with things you can't change, your best bet is to go ahead and face the facts of where you are, the reality of where you are. Come to terms with it and then hear and listen to 
the truth that comes from it. And we're going to unpack that just a little bit this morning. So let's look at, let's look at those, those three elements that Jeremiah talks about. First of all, he in a sense is telling them to face the facts. Don't believe those who paint a glossy picture about the things that will change soon. Because they're not. You're in captivity. And you're not going home till it's over. Don't build your life on false hopes by these self-appointed prophets, Jeremiah says. You're here for 70 years, period. That's basically a lifetime, is it not? And what Jeremiah is not saying is some of the people he's talking to here, if not most of them, will never go back home. It'll be the next generation that goes back. But you see, we already know this. Facts are hard. Facts are hard. We don't like the facts. You know, I've heard this expression. I, don't, I hope I can get this right. Um, I know what I believe. Don't confuse me with the facts. We generally do okay when we think trouble's going to end soon or the, the wound's going to heal quickly or the hurt will be gone away. But what if it doesn't? What if that doesn't happen? How do we live with things we can't change? Jeremiah suggests that we face the factual reality of where we are. He's saying this problem is a part of your life. He's telling the, 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 the Jewish captives, this is part of your life now. And you see, when those realities don't change, we have to face the fact that, there's, that, that this is, even though this is something dif- disappointing, and difficult, and painful, or sad. And the reality is it may not go away soon. The reality for these people, in the text it says they were going to be there for 70 years. So facts are hard. They're frightening. They're devastating. But we cannot whitewash them with a thin coat of positive thinking or bury them in the shadow of shallow soil of some kind of pie in the sky denial they are what they are they must be faced in and with the light of the truth and that truth is more enduring sometimes if not all the time than the facts jeremiah is telling his people and us that there are times when we not only must face the facts but secondly we have to also come to terms with there, in, that, in, in the case of the passage of Scripture, in there and sometimes our captivity. He says, don't put your lives on hold. Build houses, plant gardens, let your kids go out on dates and get married. Have grandchildren. Keep doing the ordinary, important, and positive things in your life that matter. Pray for the people, pray for your captives. Support your communities. In other words, make this home because it's going to be. You can't sit around for 70 years whining and complaining about the fact you're in captivity. Because if you don't make peace with the fact that you're there and come to terms with it and live in it, you will have no peace at all. And you'll be miserable. How many times do we do that? We are so caught up in complaining about something that's going on in our lives, we miss the peace that's there or the joy that goes by because our focus is on ourselves and what, what we don't like. And, and Jeremiah is telling them and us, don't do that. Realize you're where you are, come to terms with it, and live your life. Because you'll have no peace as long as you're in this self-destructive complaining mode about your situation. Perhaps the only way we'll ever be able to come to terms with the things we can't change is to begin to acknowledge, I think Jeremiah reminds us, one simple reality. Life is always going to be only so good. It will never be perfect. It will never be fully safe. It will never be completely simple, nor will it be totally smooth. There's always going to be something in there that, that, that we don't like. And that we can't change. They couldn't change, their, they couldn't change their situation. Only God could do that. And he told them it would be 70 years before he would. So get used to it, Jeremiah is saying. 
There'll be, there's always a lot we wish we could change, but we can't. And in many respects, the best thing to do is to learn to live with it. Paul had a thorn in his side, thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that was. But he got to the point that he recognized God wasn't going to take it away, so he learned to live with it. It's not easy, but it can be done through faith and through God's presence in our lives and our trust in Him to help us walk through it. And that's kind of what Jeremiah's telling the people. He's telling them that we can't put our lives on hold till things get better because they may not get better. Case in point. We don't know. We can say August 2nd, we're going to be back here. Depending on who you listen to, it could be January 2nd. Could be November. We don't know. We're not supposed to know. And I have gotten to the point where the people who think they know, I don't even listen to. Because, you know, I'm not a smart guy, but I'm smart enough to know that they probably don't know either. We take it a day at a time, we take it a week at a time. And we do what we have to do to keep one another as safe as possible. I posted the other day on a comment that it amazes me over the last three, three months or so, how many individuals that I read on Facebook have, have uh, received their medical or divinity theology degrees over these last few months because of all the medical advice I'm seeing from people who have no clue. Um, and theological uh, uh, suggestions as well. We don't know. And anybody that says they do, um, you know, I, I think even, the, the, even the, the expert medical people, as smart as they are, they tell us what they think based on their, their, their wisdom and their knowledge and understanding. And that's the best we can take. But somebody else out here that just, oh, well, I heard this from somebody's aunt who's a doctor's cousin, that doesn't, that doesn't fly. That's no good. That's what, that's what Jeremiah's talking about. Don't listen to these people who paint a rosy picture and say, oh, this is going to go away soon and, and all of that. He said, you're here for 70 years. We could be like this for three more months. We don't know. The fact is, we can't put our lives on hold until things get better. We've got to keep doing the best we can do, like this, having worship this way and other ways, the best we can do with what, we're, what we have. And uh, Jeremiah's telling those captives the exact same thing. We have to come to terms with life the way it is. We have to make peace with the things we can't change and give a decent burial to those dreams, or those, those dreams that are not going to happen and hang on to the aspirations that could perhaps still come true. So up to this point, we've learned that there are and always will be situations and circumstances in life that we have to face and come to terms with that we can't change. It's the reality of it. But Jeremiah then goes on to remind us that we have to hear and listen to the truth. Hear this again. When 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and future. He's telling Israel and us, your captivity, your problems, your issues, the bad things in your life, and the list goes on, may not end anytime soon. But this truth, the truth is great. Your captivity will not have the final word. He's telling them, your situation is not the final word. But you just said some will die there. That's true. And by faith, through their faith, their righteousness, they'll be in eternity with God. Our problems, our situation is not and does not have the last word. The final word, you see, belongs to God. Who Jeremiah says has something in mind for all of us. For them in Babylon, for us in Farmville. You see, there's a word of truth about God that is always and forever greater than the facts about life. An unusual, incredibly magnificent word of hope that says, despite all the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, 
This is God's world, and His plan is to give each believer a future and a hope, and that, my dear friends, is the truth. The worst thing that happens to us is never the last thing. The worst thing that happens to us is never the last thing. God has control of that, not us and not anybody else. For you see in Romans 8, 38 and following, we read that no life or kind of death or guilt or sorrow or pain or shame or anything else can separate us from God's love. He has the last word. I know the plans I have for you, God says. That will do. That should be enough. Should be enough for us. The truth that God is always with us and for us is enough to brighten the darkest facts that we may face with the brilliance of Easter light. That truth that God is always with us is like that Easter light that opened that tomb that Sunday morning. To give us courage to face the facts we can't change, to come to terms with those facts, to enjoy life in spite of those facts, that is what God's truth does for us. And that should be enough. We don't need to try to help God figure it out. We need to come to terms. I can't do this. I can't handle this. I can't fix it. I'm coming to peace with it. God's going to handle it. I'm going to move on with my life. That's what, that's what Jeremiah is telling the captives in Babylon. Move on with your life. When the time comes, God will take care of what's next. Because he has the last word. So let me remind us in closing that all of us are captive to something that we can't change. All of us. Our best hope is to stay on our feet, enjoy life, experience joy, and the ability to bless others is to take Jeremiah's advice for those captives now and then. Nobody wants to follow a Savior that all we do is complain about how our situation is so bad. If we believe what we claim, then we need to do what Jeremiah says. For that is where our hope is. If our hope is in our own way of trying to figure and work things out, we will fail. We will fail. We don't have the last word. The world doesn't have the last word. The government doesn't have the last word. The coronavirus doesn't have the last word. God has the last word. So let us face the facts. Let us come to terms with circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's hear and believe the truth about God's plan for us that is a future and a hope and a home. For each of us has a future with God. And that, my dear friends in Christ, is the truth. Amen. God bless you. Don't be afraid. Be smart. God gave us a brain to use. He gave us common sense. He gave us the ability to know what is best for us in, in, in many circumstances in life. And in those that we don't quite understand or can get a handle on, He knows what's best for us if we'll just listen and do what He says. So I encourage us all to do that. As I said the other night, pray for the church's leadership. This is not hard. This is not this is hard. This is not an easy thing to figure out. But we're trying to be led by how we feel God is leading us. And I know that many probably don't agree with it. Um, I know that our sister, some of our sister churches are meeting. And it's, not, it's easy to say, well, they're meeting. Why can't we? Um, but as my mother used to say, when I'd say so-and-so is doing something, why can't I? She'd say, well, if they jumped off a cliff, would you jump off with them? And my obvious answer would be, well, no. We're doing what we feel God is leading us to do for you, our church family. So it's not, like I said, it's not easy. Uh, we don't have, I don't know that we have any answers, but uh, we're just trying to deal with um, day to day. So pray for us, our deacons, our other leadership, as we seek to uh, do the best we can to keep you safe and to help uh, foster this uh, uh, notion of, of staying um, as healthy as we can. It's an unusual time. You heard that. I've heard it a thousand times. It's almost become like a bumper sticker 
but it's, re, it's, it's the reality. It's the facts that we're in. And we need to come to terms with that, and we need to hear the truth from God during these days. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you uh, when God ordains it that we can be here. But in the meantime, uh, look forward to sharing these times together. And I hope that this is a good day for you and that um, the week ahead will bring you joy and peace and blessing. Hear now this benediction that you will recognize right off after I uh, say the first four words. But it fits so aptly for what we've just talked about. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Again, God bless you. Go in peace. Have a great afternoon. Be careful of all this heat as well. Goodbye.